alone created all these things we call our own from the mighty to the small the glory of them all is God's and God's alone God Reveals the truth of all we call unknown And all the best and worst of man Can change the master's plan It's God's and God's alone God and God's alone Is fit to take is thrown. Let everything that lives reserve its highest praise for God and God alone. God and God alone will be the joy of our eternal home He will be our one desire Our hearts will never tire Of God and God alone God and God alone Is fit to take the universe's throne Let everything that lives reserve its highest praise for God and God alone. Reserve his highest praise for God and God alone. For God and God Fill my heart, fill this house. 
arms fill this day, O Lord. I am weak and I need your grace. You are the only light. You are the Fill my heart, fill this house, fill this day, O oh Lord. I am yours, I will give you praise. You are the only truth, and I will follow. house fill this day oh lord fill my spirit with your spirit until i cannot contain it fill my heart with love that cannot be explained fill the another thin vessel until grace is overflowing this barren earth is covered by your rain. Fill my heart, fill this house, fill this day, O oh Lord. Speak your word, and I house fill this day O oh Lord speak your word and I will obey so open eyes can see Good morning, Triangle Grace Church. Those of you who are gathered here and those who are joining us uh, online today, we are grateful for your presence uh, and 
A couple of announcements as we prepare to enter into worship this morning. First, uh, this Wednesday, we're going to be starting back up our Wednesday evening Bible study. We're still doing that via Zoom. Uh, so if you don't have the information that you need for that, uh, just send a message to the church office and we'll make sure to get that to you. If you uh, would like to be on our mailing list, which gives you all the information, we send out generally an email on Tuesday and then again on Friday, gives you all the information of stuff that's happening and coming up. Just send an email to us at office at trianglegrace.org and we'll be happy to put you on our mailing list so that you'll get all the information that you need. So we're gonna start this Wednesday, six o'clock. We're in John chapter 15. Even if you haven't been with us from the beginning, that's okay. You can kind of pick it up wherever and we'd love to have you join in, uh, in that on Wednesday evening. Uh, Caregiver Support is having a meeting this afternoon at two o'clock. These are folks that uh, support one another in caregiving. It is done by Zoom as well. <clears throat> and if you need information about that, um, you'll find it, I think you can find it in your bulletin or look back to your Friday email, the information is there. Or you can always uh, send me an email right after the service and I'll try and get that information to you before the two o'clock hour when they will start. And then finally, Durham Crop Walk is virtual this year, so you can walk wherever you want, uh, whenever you want. Uh, actually, it's within about a week's period of time, and uh, you can support someone who's walking or you can walk yourself, uh, and all the information is online. Uh, you'll find that information once again in your worship materials. I think that's it for our uh, announcements today. Let's worship the Lord as we hear these words from Paul as he wrote to the church in Corinth. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you would have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Let us join together in prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for Easter. We thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate Easter each and every day. We praise you for saying that you came as light into the world so that everyone who believes in you should not remain in darkness. You, Jesus, are our Savior. We praise your name, Jesus, and celebrate that in your resurrection we have victory. We thank you, Lord, for this day for the gift of the church, for the gift of your scripture, for the gift of your presence with us. We pray that we would worship you and enjoy you and glorify you this day. We pray with thanksgiving. And in your name, Jesus, amen. I'd like to invite you, if you're able, please stand where you are. Let us sing the hymn of praise, Cornerstone.
Let us join together with the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Youngest disciples to, if you want to come up and sit on the front rows, you're welcome to do that. So I've got some actual faces to talk to. And we've got some more who are through the camera. Yeah, just kind of make sure you're spread out. That's the way we have to do things these days. Uh, you know, I know that we have some people who like baseball in our congregation, don't we? Yeah, I see lots of people shaking their hands, like baseball. Um, would you believe me if I told you that uh, I'm a baseball player? You're supposed, to, you're supposed to shake your head yes, and that's good uh, for you to do that. But I've got a question for you. How could you actually tell if I'm really a baseball player? If I'm a real baseball player, I should actually play baseball, shouldn't I? I would put on a uniform, 
And I would go out onto the field like I see some of you. I, I watch some of you on Facebook. I've seen Lindsay Jane in her baseball uniform. And she, she, I mean, she's hardcore. She puts the black stuff under her eyes, a whole deal. And she's good. She can hit that ball. And, uh, and if, if I were really wanting to tell you that I was a baseball player, that's what I would do. I would put on a uniform. I would go out and I would play baseball. You know, I couldn't just hold up a glove and say, well, this proves I'm a baseball player. No, that just proves that I can hold a baseball glove. That's all that proves. But if I actually go out onto the field and start playing, and I used to be able to do that, then it shows you that I really am a baseball player. Why am I even talking about that? Well, because one of the things that we're going to talk about today is how do we know and how can others know that we're followers of Jesus? Well, we could just say it. Just like I said, I'm a baseball player, and that may or may not be true. But how could we tell if we actually do the things that Jesus wants us to do? And he says things like, love others. And he says things like, love God, first and foremost. And he says, do to other people like you would want them to do to you. So if you're hungry, you would want someone to feed you, right? And so we're supposed to help feed those who are hungry. That's what all that food is that's out in the narthex, that room outside there. There's, there's big carts full of food. All of that goes to help feed some people across town who are just not having enough food to eat right now. And so we do that because... We're followers of Jesus. That's one of the ways that we show that we're followers of Jesus. So just keep that in mind. Just like you baseball players, you show you're a baseball player because you put the uniform on, you go out, and you play the game. That's the way it's done. And you show yourself to be a follower of Jesus by doing the things that Jesus asked us to do, like love others. Right? Let's have a prayer together. I'm going to have a prayer with you guys, and then we're going to have another prayer with, uh, with the whole congregation today. Lord Jesus, we just pray for these young people that as they continue to live their lives, that they would learn more and more what it is to be a follower of Jesus and then would practice that. And we pray that they would see in us what it means to be a follower of yours. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're having children's worship today. Miss Nancy is standing there, and you guys are welcome to follow her out if you would like to go and be a part of that this morning. Otherwise, you can go back and be with your families. And that does bring us to a time of prayer this morning. A couple of particular concerns I would bring to your attention. One <clears throat> would be the White family. Uh, Suzanne's dad is uh, not doing well. He's started some new chemotherapy. Uh, but uh, the prognosis is not good, uh, even in terms of that. So uh, Suzanne and the kids are all out in California with her dad, having some good time, uh, some good family time. So just keep Suzanne and her family, especially in prayer. Got an email just last evening that was um, just, just a sad email from Leslie Hollingsworth, who wrote to say that she had received a call that her 54-year-old son was found dead in his apartment. I know nothing else besides what I just told you other than we need to lift Leslie and her family before the Lord in prayer. Uh, if we are able to share any other information, we'll do that later on. But right now, we just need to hold Leslie before the Lord. Let's turn to the Lord as we look to God in a time of prayer and meditation. Let us pray. Holy God, just last weekend, we declared of Jesus that he is risen and the reality of that cry has not changed. We give you thanks that we have walked through another week with the risen Savior by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. And we know that with each new Sunday, we celebrate Jesus' resurrection and we celebrate the power that we have in him as we live as his disciples. Thank you, Lord, that because he lives, we can face each new day with confidence and with joy. Thank you, Lord, that because he lives, we have a meaning and a purpose in life that would not have been possible apart from a relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, that because he lives, nothing can separate us from your love and mercy and grace. We're grateful that you've invited us into your presence through prayer. 
We're grateful that your promise to us in prayer is that it is not a meaningless endeavor, but rather it avails much. And so we know that you give good gifts, and this is one of those good gifts. We're grateful that we can come before your throne of grace, that we don't have to make an appointment, that we can just come whenever uh, our hearts, at our heart's desire to lift our concerns and our praises before you. As we come to you this morning, we do so with thanks uh, for who you are, for all that you do in our lives. Uh, we worship and adore you for you alone are worthy of our praise. And we come confessing that we've not lived the way that we should, but we're grateful that through your grace, you forgive us. And because of your love, you continue to invite us into your presence. Especially we lift before you our world and our country and our community. We pray for your peace to rule in places where there's conflict. We pray for your righteousness to come to bear in places of injustice. We pray that you would use us to be instruments of your peace as we share the good news of Jesus. We pray that you would give wisdom and discernment to us, but especially to those who lead us. We pray for family and friends and even strangers who are going through difficult days. We pray that your hand of healing would rest upon those who need to feel that touch. We pray that you would touch hearts that need redeeming. And we pray, Lord, that you would keep before our minds and hearts those things that break your heart. And we pray that you would give us eyes to see the things that you see in the world. Hear our prayers this day, O God, and answer them according to your perfect and holy will. And hear us now as together we pray the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're pleased this morning to have an ensemble of our choir here to present some special music.
This morning we're uh, heading into 1 John, a little letter toward the end of Scripture, which we began before our church-wide study, and we're going to pick up where we left off, <clears throat> which means we'll be looking at chapter 2, beginning with verse 7, and then going through verse 17. John, 1 John chapter 2, beginning with verse 7. As we come to this part of God's Word, let me invite you to pray with me. Lord, indeed, we are grateful that you have begun a good work in us and you continue to do that work through the power of your Holy Spirit. We're grateful for that Spirit who breathed out these words through the Gospel writer John long ago and who continues to breathe them into your people even now. We're grateful that your Word is a written Word that bears testimony to who we know as the living Word, Jesus Christ. So once again, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear as we seek to follow him. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes." I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I'm writing to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God ab abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, after engaging in our uh, study through uh, the Lenten season, uh, we're now coming back to 1 John. I hope that you remembered that we actually were studying 1 John before we took that break during Lent. Um, before we kind of move into the text that we're going to deal with today, I thought it might be at least a little bit helpful if we looked once again at the context of John's writing here. We believe that this John is the same John who wrote the Gospel of John and who also wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, he was Jesus' youngest disciple. He lived longer than any of the other disciples. Uh, and if you listened in to the sermons during our Lenten study, one of the things that I said at one point was, uh, I think that this John is the one who refers to himself in his gospel as the disciple Jesus loved. And so we get a little bit of background on who this John is. He is an intimate disciple of Jesus Christ. And in this letter, he's writing to the church in order to help them have confidence and assurance concerning the content of the true gospel and to make sure that they understand that they are in that gospel, that they are in the word, but also that their salvation is secure in Christ. Uh, John's bottom line, I think, is helping true disciples know that their salvation is secure. He talks about that in his gospel, but he also talks about it here in this letter. Um, he did this because there were some false teachers who had already made their way into the early church. And <clears throat> we think that's pretty early, but indeed it doesn't take long for the false gospel to, to find its way into places. And, and the false teaching that we see in John's letter is a teaching that seems to be a forerunner of some of the later misteachings or what we call heresies that came into the church later on. 
uh, and a number of those letter of uh, those heresies became sort of full blown uh, later in the life of the church, and we actually see some of them even in the life of the church today. Uh, much of it falls along the line of Greek thought, and if you'll remember, we talked about this understanding of the Greeks that that the physical and the spiritual are two separate entities. Uh, that you and I have a spirit, but we also have a body that are actually separated from one another. Uh, and the body is basically evil, and the spirit is inherently good. Now, the implication of that kind of false teaching uh, in terms of separating body from spirit uh, is that people thought they could go on sinning in their bodies as long as it didn't taint their souls. Uh, and the thought was, <coughs> excuse me, you can do whatever you want because it really doesn't have any eternal consequences as long as you keep your soul out of it. Well, scripture makes very clear that Christ came to redeem the whole person. And that is why when we celebrated last Sunday the resurrection of Jesus, we celebrate a bodily resurrection. And all the language that we have in the Gospels points toward a bodily resurrection. Uh, not that his body was stolen or just his spirit uh, went to be with the Father. No, it's a bodily resurrection. Uh, and there's a further implication to this false teaching if we kind of separate uh, body and spirit, making one evil and the other good. Uh, and that other implication is that God could never actually become a human being. He could not come into the creation as Jesus did uh, because that would mean that God was dwelling in evil and God just simply cannot do that. Um, now, these early teachers, these false teachers, they didn't deny the historical uh, presence of Jesus. Uh, they thought there was a person that you could look at and point and say, that is Jesus of Nazareth. But their assertion was that it only seemed that he was God in the flesh, that he really wasn't God in the flesh, but he just seemed that way, kind of an illusion. Uh, it was in appearance only. Some even taught that uh, Jesus at his baptism had the spirit come upon him and then the spirit left him just before the crucifixion. Now, when you understand the context, this false teaching that had come into the church at this time, uh, it helps us to understand why John would write this letter in the first place. John is waging a battle for the very essence of the Christian faith, which encompasses the true nature of Jesus as really and truly and completely God and really and truly and completely man all at the same time. We understand that as being one of the great mysteries of the faith, the incarnation, a great mystery of the faith. Now mystery, you remember our definition of mystery, it's something that we don't understand but which is still absolutely true. And there are a number of things that fall into that category for us as followers of Jesus. Another being the Trinity, for example. So he's writing about the authenticity of Jesus Christ. And he's also writing to bring assurance to these early believers that they are actually in the fold of God's love. So this is critical stuff that he's dealing with here. If Jesus wasn't who he claimed to be, if Jesus was not truly God and truly human, if Jesus didn't overcome sin, if he didn't really rise from death, then Paul says we're the most to be pitied. There was no reason for us to gather last weekend for Easter, and there certainly is no reason for us to continue to meet week after week on what we look at as Sunday's little Easter's as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Easter just becomes an empty holiday. But if it's true, and you and I know we believe it is, if it's true, it changes everything. I was reading an article just this week by Tim Keller, and many of you know Tim Keller was diagnosed with a pretty severe uh, form of cancer, and he's dealing with that, and he talks about how this has really brought he and his wife deeply into their prayer lives. But he says this, he says, if Jesus Christ was actually raised from the dead, 
If he really got up and walked out, was seen by hundreds of people and talked to them, if he was raised from the dead, then you know what? Everything is going to be all right. If Jesus really was who he said he was, if Easter really happened, everything's ultimately going to be all right. It's going to be okay. In a world marred by sin, in a world dealing still with a pandemic, in a world where we experience violence and hatred, the resurrection speaks a word of hope. It says all things will not always be as they are now. It says a day is coming when Christ will come again and he'll make all things new. The old earth will pass away. A new earth will, will be reconstituted by God. All things will be new in Christ Jesus. It's going to be all right. Now, as we look at our text today, we do so from the perspective of recognizing that's what John is telling us. He's telling us that, yes, there's light and darkness in the world, but everything is ultimately going to be all right for those who are in Christ Jesus. John Stott, one of the great theologians of the church, um, said that after the introduction, which we've already kind of gone through in 1 John, he says that John sets forth three tests to determine where we stand. Uh, the first is a moral test, which is a test of obedience. The second is a social test, which is a test of love. And then there is a doctrinal test, which is a test of belief in Christ. Now, when you think about it, that really kind of gives us a good outline of John's gospel. And so we're going to kind of proceed using that rubric uh, as uh, the way that we will we'll move ahead. Uh, you may remember that I said that this letter of John actually reads more like a sermon. And if that is indeed the case, that it is really more a sermon than a letter, then this rubric that we get from John uh, Stott really kind of makes sense, where you can say, okay, point one, point two, point three. Uh, so if we follow that idea, we've already looked at the moral test, uh, which was obedience. That's in chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. And remember we basically said that John said um, that obedience is a great sign of authentic discipleship. Um, he writes, if we love him, if we say we know him, we'll keep his commandments. Uh, Jesus said the same thing. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Um, I've titled the series uh, that you may know, and I think John wants us to know that we're really children of God and that we're a part of God's kingdom. And so here's one of the signs that we can look at in our own lives to see if we fit the criteria, if you will. If we are abiding in him, our conduct should be an indicator of that reality. Uh, we don't obey in order to join his family. We don't obey in order to remain in his family. We obey because we are in the family of God. That's where our obedience comes from. It comes from a desire to follow our master because we are in his family. Many years ago, I had a conversation with a guy who at that time was a really well-known Christian writer. I uh, was directing a conference, and he and his wife were speakers uh, at the conference, and, and we were having this conversation. Our kids were about the same age back in those days, and um, he was talking about how they had created a family culture, and a part of the family culture was we do certain things because we are who we are. And um, for example, uh, if one of the children said, you know, Dad, why do we have to do this? His reply would be, well, because that's what our family does. And I thought it was kind of an interesting concept. I used it on my kids a few times uh, after that through the years. You know, why do we have to do such and such? I say, because that's what cobs do. Uh, and there are ways that we can kind of create that sort of culture in our families. Well, there is a culture in the family of God. We do the things we do because that's who we are. That's what we're about. We're followers of Jesus, and that's what followers of Jesus do. Those who are in the family obey the master, not because we must, but because we can. 
It's just what we do. So that's the obedience test. That's the, now we move on to the social test, which is uh, what Stott calls the test of love. Now, John's language, admittedly, is a little confusing here uh, because he says, I'm not writing you a new commandment, but rather an old commandment. <clears throat> and then later on, he says, but then again, it is a new commandment. So is the commandment new or is the commandment old? Well, the answer is yes. It's both. It's an old commandment and a new commandment. Perhaps you notice that John actually doesn't tell us what the commandment is explicitly. Uh, what he does is he talks about love, Jesus' love, the necessity for us to love. And we know all that Jesus said about that, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second commandment's like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus tells us the greatest commandment is a commandment to love. And the command to love could easily be considered the old commandment. I mean, these people had heard this. This was not new stuff to them. But it was new, perhaps, because of the perspective that Jesus had taken in redefining the objects of our love, the people that we love. Well, they had heard words about loving your neighbor, and then Jesus told them who their neighbors actually were. And sometimes that came as a surprise to them. And don't we also at times uh, find ourselves challenged by the command of Jesus to love our neighbor? Sometimes we, like the religious leaders of that day, ask the question, well, who is my neighbor? And like those opponents of Jesus, we sometimes don't like the answer that Jesus gives. See, Jesus' command to love often reaches far beyond our comfort zones. It takes us to places that we would much rather not go. In the case of Jesus himself, it took him to the cross. That's what his love did. I love that line in the song that I had a couple of folks sing during the um, Easter season. Why did they nail his feet and hands his love would have held him there? As it speaks about Jesus going to the cross. The self-giving love of God is present in the world now because John says the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. See, this is not something we have to just simply look forward to. It's already in process. And we're able to look around us and we're able to see in the world wonderful glimpses of that self-giving love of God. Jesus has already brought his light into the world. And John assures us that the world is on a trajectory that will lead it out of darkness and into the light of Christ. You know, Jesus said of himself, I'm the light of the world. And then he said to his followers, you know, let your light shine. Well, ours is a reflective light. You know, as the moon reflects the light of the sun, so we are called to reflect the character and love of Jesus to those around us. That's why John goes on to say, whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. But whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. See, it's what you do. It takes us back to the uh, concept of obedience as an indicator of our discipleship. It's all about being in the light, and we know the light. We know who he is. We know what he calls us to do, but we can't reflect the light of Jesus. We can't abide in his light if we're not in relationship with him. It all has to do with being in relationship with Jesus Christ. John wants his readers to know him and to know that they are in him. And so it comes back to that assurance. How can you know? Well, look at your life. What do you see in your own life? Some of these young disciples were most doubtedly, were undoubtedly doubting their faith. Uh, they had been led to believe 
you know, that there were other things you had to do. It wasn't just really about uh, even obedience or loving. It wasn't really about just being in relationship with Jesus. You, know, you had to have this kind of extra spiritual knowledge. You know, it was kind of like needing to know the, the secret handshake. And John says, no, that's not the way it works. It's about dwelling in the light, which we know means being in an authentic relationship with Jesus. And Jesus has said, come to all who would believe, come. The test of that relationship is that we love as we've been loved. Now, sometimes we find love in places other than believers of Jesus. That's because you can fake it sometimes for a while, but it won't go on forever. Scripture holds forth that this criteria of love is something that really belongs to believers, to followers of Christ. It's, it's one of the gifts that God gives us. It's the ability to be able to love even those who at times seem unlovable. And so as we believe in God, it's not just a matter of saying that. It's a matter of living it out. It's a matter of doing what we can do in order to reflect the love that we've already experienced. If you kind of think about it from a strictly physical perspective, it's not at all difficult to discern whether you're in the light or in the darkness. Do any of you have a real problem with trying to figure that out? I've never had a problem with knowing I was in the light or I was in the darkness. I knew immediately whether I was in one or the other. We can know that physically. John says you can know it spiritually as well. It's possible for you to know that you are a child of God. And so we don't have to second guess if we're a part of God's kingdom. So just take an honest look at your life. You're either walking in the darkness or you're walking in the light. If you're walking in the light, doesn't mean that you've ceased to sin. We all know that we're still struggling with that kind of internal struggle where, where we continue to sin on occasion, but we look at sin differently as followers of Jesus. In Christ, we turn from sin. We repent. In Christ, we recognize the love and the freedom of God's forgiveness for our sins. Now we come to a part in the text where John kind of seems to jump off topic, if you will. Uh, he talks about two or three groups within the church, depends on kind of how you look at it, uh, as he speaks about little children and fathers and young men. Now, this is all masculine language. Ladies, this does include you. Uh, that's just the way they wrote back then. Shouldn't have done it that way, but that's the way that they did it. So, so you're included in all of this. Uh, some believe that little children really just is all of us so that fathers and young men inc are included in that designation as well. Others think it's really three kind of separate stages, if you will, in our Christian life. I seem to go that direction. Uh, little children, I think, refers to those who may be new in their faith, or at least more immature in their faith. And there are certain parts where you and I fall into that category as little children. We may be this far along in this part of our faith, but maybe only this far along in other parts. So little children are those who are new to the faith. He says uh, to them, your sins are forgiven. Um, your sins are forgiven in his name. You know the Father. And then he speaks to fathers who he identifies, uh, I think, as those who are more mature in the faith those who've been around for a while, those who have practiced the faith uh, to the point of they have wisdom, they have something to share with, with those who are less mature in the faith. And he says to them, uh, you've known him from the beginning. You know the Father. You know, you've known him from the beginning. And then he talks about young men. I might think about those who are kind of still uh, in the midst of the fray of spiritual battle. And he says to them, you've overcome the evil one because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. Do you notice that, that he does that? Uh, he repeats it again. And some of the words are pretty much the same words. Uh, interestingly, 
though the verbs change from present to past tense in that. Uh, that brings us to believe that there are some practical implications that John has for us, whether we consider ourselves to be little children or we consider ourselves to be fathers, older, mature people in the faith, or whether we kind of sense that we're the ones who are right now on the front lines of the faith, those who are, who are in the midst of the battle. And we find these implications in the last verses that we read this morning. I want to spend the last couple of minutes just talking about uh, three things, really two kind of implications and then a question that comes as a result of those two implications. The first thing is that he basically tells us we should love the right thing. And then he tells us we need to be investing in the right place. And then finally the question is, what do you and I need to change in our lives so that we can do those first two things? So let's look at the first one. The first thing is love the right thing. Uh, we should not love the world or the things of the world. That's what, that's what John tells us. That doesn't mean that we can't enjoy the good things that the world has to offer. You know, God has given us this wonderful creation, other than the pollen. It's a wonderful creation. Uh, and it's for our enjoyment. It's for... Uh, our goodness. And so we are able to enjoy all of those things. There are good gifts in life that are meant for our pleasure. But loving the right thing really kind of goes a step deeper than that. When John says don't love the world, he, he's saying that nothing in this world should take precedence over our love for God and for the kingdom of God. To not love the world means to love God above all else. And, and so we just need to kind of get that in our minds and in our thoughts. Because what that means is it has to do with priorities and how we prioritize our lives. And often we can determine what we're really uh, loving by just looking at some of the documents that we keep in our lives. Uh, most of them are on our phones now. You know, you can look at your calendar, you can look at your bank statement, you can look at those sorts of things, and you can tell where are, what are you loving? You know, where do you love to spend your time? Where do you love to uh, put your resources? Well, if we're going to love rightly, what that means is, number two, we have to invest in the right places. When I was in eighth grade, I had my first experience in high-risk financial investment. Uh, each person in our social studies class was invited to uh, donate one dollar to the class so that we could buy a share of stock. Uh, and then the idea was we would follow that stock throughout the church, or church year, throughout the school year, and then see where we are at the end. Uh, back in those days, uh, you actually had to open a newspaper and you had to find the stock reports and you had to find those. And so we had those in our class. And you can imagine that having just one dollar from each class person did not mean that we were looking at every stock to purchase, but there were a limited number of stocks that we could buy uh, with that limited income. And so we did our research, we looked at past performance, all of those sorts of things, and we settled on Alaskan Airlines. Through the year, we watched its performance week by week with great interest. And then at the end of the year, we sold it and lost our shirts. <laughs> all the money was basically gone. Uh, that was pretty much the end of my stock market investing career. I let other people deal with such things now. It's critical that we invest in the right places if we're going to get the kind of return that we desire. You know, when you come to the end of your life, what is your portfolio going to reveal? I've shared with you before that uh, when I, I went to a high school that was sort of strange from the perspective, even though it was probably illegal at that time, <clears throat> that uh, we could pray um, over the intercom in the morning <laughs> and we could uh, read scripture, those sorts of things. Uh, and there was a football coach at this high school uh, who would give out Bibles. 
and uh, he gave me a Bible, and he wrote the same thing in the front of every Bible. It said this, this life on earth will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Well, that brings us to the concluding question. What needs to change in our lives in order to make sure that we are loving rightly and investing wisely? Well, Jesus gave some pretty good investment advice. He said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, that kind of investing is not always easy and it's not always comfortable. See, loving as Christ loved can be costly because it requires commitment and it requires sacrifice. Loving as Christ loved is not just about being convenient. At times, it is quite inconvenient to love as Jesus loved. And obedience at times calls us to uncomfortable places. It even requires sometimes that we stand in opposition to the culture in which we live. And so if we're going to invest truly in Christ, there are times when we may find ourselves on the outside of the circle, so to speak. But saying all of that, recognizing that there is at times a cost to following Jesus, I can also tell you the dividends are fantastic. Life. Eternal life, which you know has already begun for us. You ever think about it that way? You've already begun eternal life in, in Christ Jesus. You don't have to wait till you die. No, it starts now. And the life that we have, Jesus characterized it as being abundant life. There are great gifts that God gives to us as his followers. And we have the gift of his Holy Spirit. We have the power within our lives, which scripture tells us is the same power that rose Jesus from death. That's the kind of power we have to work with. And we know that we have a God who has promised to abide with us forever. John reminds us the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. And the Apostle Paul wrote at one point, our light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So friends, as we think about loving, as we think about investing our lives, as we think about what does it mean to truly be a follower of Jesus Christ, the question which we need to continually keep before us is, what kind of return are we expecting? Amen. Our closing uh, hymn this morning is one that maybe you sang around campfires somewhere. Uh, they'll know we are Christians by our love, and really that is such a true statement. Uh, one of the ways that, we, that others know who we are, it's the love that we reflect. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Oh.
and save each one's pride, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Oh, praise to the Father from whom all things come, and all praise to Christ Jesus, His, His only Son, and all Christians by our love. How is it that we reflect who we are to the world around us? It has to do with how we stand in the grocery store line. It has to do with how we drive on the interstate. It has to do with how we react to the neighbors to our left and to our right and perhaps those who are across the street. It has to do with how we deal with every single person who crosses our pathway. Will they know we are Christians by our love? That's one of the tests that it seems John is giving to the church. You want to know if you're a follower of Jesus? Well, what does your life look like? Are you obeying the commands, showing that you love Jesus? Are you loving others? as a result of loving God first and foremost. That's our challenge as we seek to be ambassadors for the kingdom in a world that needs some love, a world that needs to experience God's grace. So friends, go out into God's world and be the people who you are. Be those who Share the good news of the gospel as you share your life with others by loving them well and investing in those places where you will find a great return for the kingdom. And as you go, go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you, abide with you, uplift you, and empower you both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.